Welcome back, Lake Eufaula Christian Church. It is a beautiful Mother's Day. I really hope that you're getting to enjoy it with your, your loved ones, especially today. I pray that on this special day that we are thanking God for our mother figures, those mother figures in our lives. And that doesn't just have to be our mother or our grandmother. It can be for those folks that took us under their wing, took care of us, protected us, helped us in so many different ways growing up in our life. So I pray that, you know, as I'm looking at my lovely mother and my sweet wife today, both of those lovely ladies are Proverbs 31 women. They are Proverbs 31 women. And listen to this passage. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Now see, does that describe any of the maternal uh, figures in your life? Because it does for me. The, think about this, a little synopsis. Strong, dignified, kind, wise, a blessing to her household, hardworking. Those are fantastic. That's only like a three verse snippet that I read you from Proverbs 31. But those things right there are amazing and they absolutely talk about the ladies in my life that God has blessed me with. So today, guys, I want you to make sure that you're doing a good job of letting your, your wife or your loved one or your mother know that they are a special gift from God today. And even if you want to find one of those verses that matches up with them, read Proverbs 31 and see if something doesn't speak to you. So thank you, mothers. What a beautiful day it is to celebrate you. Now, let me get started here today with a little bit of a sermon illustration. We have this small stretch of land. And on our property, it is way too rough on this little stretch of land to be able to mow it. Um, it, it just doesn't have much potential to be a nice lawn right now. And I still mow it several times a year, but it's not easy. It's, it's pretty much, it's kind of like this. Um, it's it's kind of like mowing a field of rocks, to be honest with you. That's not me, but that could very much be me. You know, mowing on like a rocky hillside where it looks like you're about to die. That's kind of like my life sometimes, trying to mow this, this place out here. But um, I'll tell you, it's, it's not easy. Even if I spray some weed killer around this area, it's still not very good. Um, and I still have to mow sometimes. So about half of the area that I would like to smooth out, make it a lawn, other half's a hillside, kind of treacherous, definitely not what I would want my daughter one day to be helping me mow or something like that. So I'm always thinking about how I can improve the land. And so today we're talking about a life mission. In this, this 40 days with Jesus as we're getting into it, we're talking about an encounter where Jesus is talking about his life mission, new life mission for his followers. And so when I think about mowing this rocky hillside, I'm always out there thinking about how can I improve this land? What does the mission of this place need to be? How do we need to reclaim this ground to be this crazy, wild, tangled, jumbled mess to something that can be more accessible, more beautiful, more comfortable? Now see, um, what, uh, to give you an example, like my mother's kind of like the tree lady. You know, growing up, and I've watched my mother propagate trees. She takes, that means she takes big, takes little cuttings from big trees and makes little trees that grow into big trees. She propagates trees. My mom is kind of like the tree lady. Out here on this property, sometimes every, every year I'm asking her, hey, do you have a tree? Hey, do you have a tree? She's always kind, wise, giving me a tree or two to plant. Some of them are really good and make it really well. I've gotten better at it. Some of them not so much. This is kind of a rough spot. It's not ideal for growing trees, but every year I kind of learn a little bit better how to do it. And this goes back to even me being a child in my little hometown of Prague, um, growing up in our, my little childhood house. And I remember carrying five gallon buckets of water from the house down to the pasture where my mother was planting new trees that she had possibly been growing, doing different things. And, um, you know, with me around, it was probably more like, you know, I was more in the way than I was helping or getting anything right. But she was still patient. She was still kind, even though I was probably just slowing her down. But it was in those little moments where she's kind of teaching me how she's planting trees and how, how we need to, to foster uh, the growth in these trees that she's always working in a story, uh, maybe a, an old hymn song that we're singing together. Maybe we're praying over something. And it was, it was a process. It was an experience. It wasn't just, 
Well, I got to go plant those trees in the pasture. Come on, son. Get up off your hiney and help me carry this big bucket full of water. There was always something other than just that. And so that message and that kind of mission has kind of spilled over into my life so that I can do the same thing with my daughter. And one of the things that my mom wanted me to be able to do was she wanted me to, to be able to say, I helped plant some of those trees. I helped take care of some of those trees. And it's the same way with my daughter. You know, most of you know that before, before Kim and I had Avonlea, that we weren't very good at being green thumbs. You know, we, we killed a lot of stuff trying to make our land look a little bit prettier out there where we're at here in Ufala. And, you know, it was kind of like, uh, there's not really a real mission here. It's like, well, we need, maybe we need to plant something here. But it wasn't about like planting the right plant in the right place or anything like that. It was just kind of haphazard. There was really no mission. But after our baby girl came along, it's like, we need to do something. We need to be more intentional about how we make this place more accessible and more pretty and um, more safe so that she can really appreciate it. And then we can appreciate these kind of simple pleasures of life. So... Whenever I think about that, I saw how my daughter started to take to it. Let me show you this little example. This is her um, just doing what we do. She loves to just kind of help out around the house. This was last summer. She's just helping spray the roses, helping take care of things. That's, that's my little daughter, you know? Um, so what I noticed from that was it gave us the opportunity and the joy of working with our daughter outside. It gave us the opportunity. It allowed us to be able to say, okay, now she will look back on this and she will say, I remember helping tend that garden. I remember helping plant those trees or those flowers. And it also was helping her grow a little bit more her skills and her ambition about being better at something. So what were we, what are we really doing? What was my mother really doing with me as a child? The same thing that we need to be doing right now in our Christian walk. We need to make disciples. We are making disciples. So my mother, in her patience and her kindness, even though she could have done it faster herself, she was training me in the things that she was getting increasingly good at, better at, which is exactly what we do, Kim and I do today. So hopefully one day my little daughter will look back and say, yeah, you know, they were patient with me and they showed me how to do this and now I can grow my own food and now I can grow my own pretty flowers and all these beautiful things you know so it's it's a wonderful thing to be able to make disciples and that's what Jesus told us to do he told us to make disciples so today we're reading from the book of Matthew the last chapter it's Matthew Matthew chapter 28 and at the end of this chapter we're talking about the Great Commission and the Great Commission um, is kind of an, a command for evangelism. But there's no denying that evangelism also relates to and coincides with making disciples. And now making disciples is more, it's more of a longer process. It's more drawn out. Um, it's more time consuming than just sharing the gospel. Making disciples requires a great deal of effort beyond that just initial sharing of the gospel. And at times it can kind of make you feel like that you've been wasting your time. I mean, it can absolutely feel like, man, this is maddening. I'm pouring out my life and my heart and my time, and this, just, I, it, could be do, it could be doing so much better. I could be so much more efficient if I just wouldn't waste my time. I don't know if you've ever felt like that. I have. And God has shown me that that's not the attitude I should ever, ever have. And so consider Jesus. For three years, on this earth, he went about doing the work of his father. For three years, he had the company of 12 men dragging along behind him everywhere he went. And in a lot of ways, those 12 men were kind of like children. They fought, they argued, they lacked understanding, even though Jesus tried to tell them things over and over and over again, they still lacked understanding. And so it's kind of funny to even imagine how much more could have Jesus done if he hadn't been you know, trying to deal with these 12 men. But see, that's not God's will. God's will was to make sure that he was bringing people along through failures, through struggles, through temptations, bring them along. So the process of discipleship and making disciples 
is the patient, time-consuming process of taking younger believers along with us. When we go out and we do the work of the Father, we need to be able to show them and be able to help guide them in their faith and their service. Now see, in kind of an efficiency-based culture, we want to be able to get things done quickly and properly and be done so that we can move on to the next thing. And I totally get that. But I know that my mother didn't bring me along so that she could be more efficient. She brought me along because of the tremendous value that she placed upon me. And that's the same thing that I try to do with my daughter and my lovely wife tries to do with my daughter. And that's the way we feel about our sweet girl. So really, when you think about it, this is what drove the Savior's earthly ministry. It wasn't just about being efficient. It was about the love of people to bring them along and show them God's way. So what do you think Jesus might be trying to show you today, guys? What do you think he's patiently been bringing you along to try to show you? Let's think about that as we jump into more of our sermon today. It is week four of 40 Days with Jesus. Today we're talking about our life mission. So if you've got your Bibles, I need you to open them to Matthew chapter 28. And we're just reading five verses. Just Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. And it says this, guys. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So I want to highlight three little aspects that which Jesus gives us today. If we are followers of Christ, Jesus gives us a life mission. You're not just meant to come and sit in a pew at church for the next 50 years of your life, and that's it. He's actually giving you a life mission. And so it's something that it's good to come and get filled, get your spiritual cup filled up, but you're not meant to just come and sit and never do, ever, anything. That's not the way he's trying to bring you along. So if we're followers of Christ, Jesus gives us a life mission. So for our life mission, we need to know some things. The source of our life mission is Jesus. The goal of our life mission is to transform lives. And the power behind our life mission is his presence. So let's talk about the source. The source of our mission is Jesus today. The problem that we often have when it comes to discovering our life mission is that we go to the wrong source. Now see, guys, I've told you before that, um, you know, when I was a, a young man, especially in my upper teens, early 20s, you know, most kids today, they're like, I don't care what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm just going to have fun. When I was in my upper teens, early 20s, I was, it was kind of like pressure. I'm like, man, I'm, I need to know what I'm supposed to do with myself. I know what I'm supposed to do with my life. Yeah, I'm going to college, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still doing the church thing, and I'm still helping out, and you know, but I, I don't really know what I'm supposed to do. And so I was trying to kind of continue to look outside of just going to Jesus himself and to know ultimately what my life purpose was. So it's significant before Jesus commissioned his disciples— it's highly significant that you understand that he reminded them of his authority to do so. Look at verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So why is this important? First, it's worth noting that Jesus' authority was given to him. He said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Who by? His Father God. So in light, now he goes on to say, and going in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's a Trinitarian statement. All three, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So it's, it's interesting for you to know that once you see those words together where Jesus is explaining them, we can begin to kind of grasp the full implications of his authority. 
Jesus, the man who was anointed, the man who was crucified, the man who was buried, the man who was resurrected, and now he's risen, is also not just a man. He is the divine son of God. God, the creator of everything. And so he has received his authority both as the son of God, but from God the Father himself. So that's incredibly important. You need to know all of the authority. All of the authority from the things that you see belong to Jesus. All authority, everything, including you. So when you realize that, it should change the way your outlook sees your life mission. Okay? So what's a point here? Oh, Jesus' authority is universal. That's the second extent of his authority. It is universal. It is in heaven and on earth. So the implications of this are huge. In the context of the Great Commission that immediately follows this verse, it highlights that Christ is true authority over all creation. And that is the assurance that his disciples then, 2,000 years ago, and us, his disciples now, that when we go to share the good news, we're not just doing it in our own strength. It's not just about us. We are doing it in the authority of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen? That is real authority. And everything is under the authority of Jesus. We just don't always realize it, know it, or trust it. So he uniquely understands that us, he uniquely understands us and knows how we can play our part in the changing of other people's lives because Jesus is sovereign over all. So in other words, if you want to find out and receive your true life mission, you have to go to Jesus. You need to go to him. Stop looking at just everything that the world tries to tell you to do and go to Jesus. Now see, I've had a lot of different jobs in my life. I've been trained in a lot of different ways, different types of skill sets, different types of things that I can do or that I'm able to do. But at the end of the day, even though I'd be trained, I'd be doing well in a job, I still didn't really feel like I was fulfilled. Like, I don't... Yeah, I mean, it's good, but it's, it's a job. When you really understand that Jesus is the source of everything, when you go to him and you find out how he can really use you, that's when you understand your life mission. It's not in everything else of the world. It's in him. So we need to go to him. The second aspect of our life mission is this. It's the goal. The goal of our life mission is to do what? Transform people's lives. That's why we're here. So this is incredibly important. When we come to Jesus, I hope that your life is transformed. Now sometimes, sometimes we may not feel like our life is instantly transformed. And we've talked about this before in sermons in the past. You need to continue to make yourself an available home for the Holy Spirit. To be able to be used, to not shrink away from the power of God, but instead to step forward into the power of God for him to be able to use you. And so the goal of our mission is to transform lives. And so hopefully we are becoming more transformed as we continue to yield ourselves to our Savior and to our Creator. But look what he said here in verse 19 and 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So the main clause of this sentence is to call all of his disciples to learn these things. Go, baptize, teach. That's pretty simple. We make it very difficult. But in those words, it's go, it's baptize, and it's teach. So at the very heart of our life mission is this go. Now, while we are definitely called together as Christians, and, and guys, I, I love being around you all. I miss you all whenever I don't get to see you. Our, our church family does has so much fun together. There was, a, there was a good group of people up here last night doing Mother's Day photos with our, our, our beautiful backdrops and things that we had. It was awesome. 
And you can tell that people love and really care about each other and miss each other when we don't get to see them. But we weren't supposed to just stay within these four walls. At the heart of our life mission, the master himself gave us an assignment. Go. So I find it helpful to summarize how we are supposed to go by looking at a few different things. And I kept trying to think about, you know, how if I was teaching, if I was still doing my youth ministry stuff, how would I teach this to the kiddos? And I kept thinking of the W. Now, see, my, my, my good buddies who are, you know, OSU fans, you know, you know I'm a Sooner fan, so this is not pistols firing. This is a W, okay? So this is a W. So I want you to remember the three W's today for, for being able to, uh, to basically to go. And so if we're going to go, how can we go? And that is in works, in words, and in wonders. So firstly, let's talk about works. This happens because of our changed lifestyle and because of the things that we want to go to be the hands and feet of serving God's people through Jesus. So through our changed lifestyle and through actively serving others in the name of Jesus and in the love of Jesus, we see these, I always think about this example from um, the Sermon on the Mount earlier in the, in, the, in the book of Matthew, I think it was Matthew chapter 5, where uh, Jesus is saying, you know, you are the light of the world. And since you're the light, on the, world, light of the world, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. So neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. No. What do they do? Instead, they... They put their light on a lampstand so that it can illuminate the whole house, bring light to everybody in the house. And that way, we let our light shine before others, and we help them to see our good works that come from our Father in heaven. It's not about us. It's about shining our light for others. That is, a lot of times, some of those beautiful works that we do. Sometimes that's through our changed lifestyle. When we come to know Jesus and we understand it's not about me anymore. You know, I, you know, so like, I'll give an example. If it was somebody that was, that used to get drunk all the time, somebody that used to smoke weed all the time and just get so messed up. But after becoming a Christian, if something changed, if their heart saw a different way to bring glory to God then that is a changed lifestyle. And when other people see that, it's going, man, what's going on with that guy? That's a changed lifestyle. And then picture that that same guy now starts to go and do more things to serve with his church. That is works. That's going in works, the first W. And works sometimes is what shows people the gospel before you ever speak a word. Of Jesus before you ever go evangelize you know, a lot of people get this scared feeling about being evangelistic and having to spread the word of God oh my goodness I'm just I'm so scared sometimes the works are what bring people the gospel first before the words but let's talk about but we weren't just supposed to you know just supposed to do things we're also supposed to be able to give words so when we go with works, that often opens the doors for us to speak with words concerning the issue and the essence of the good news of Jesus. Now, if we were looking from uh, Mark chapter 16, you know, Mark chapter 16, Mark was the first gospel of the four gospels. And so that's kind of the more ancient of the others. And so he put it this way in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. He said, he said to them, Jesus said to them, go into all the world, preach. The gospel to every creature or all creation preach whoever believes and is baptized will be saved so whenever we talk about that preach the good news a lot of people think i'm not a preacher well guess what for all my whole life i'm thinking i'm not a preacher either y'all so don't stay stuck in that excuse every christian believer is a teacher you just don't realize it you're either teaching the people around you that Jesus is important, that he has an impact on your life, that he has changed you somehow, you want to share that love, you're either teaching people that or you're teaching them, no, church isn't important. I mean, I, I'm a Christian, but I mean, I don't, I'm not a practicing Christian, you know. 
I don't really go, I don't really care. You're either teaching the world this, or you're teaching the world this. Every Christian believer is a teacher, even though you don't realize it. So don't get scared away that oh, I've got to go preach the gospel. I can't do that. I'm not an evangelist. That's not my spiritual gift. That's okay. That's okay. But what is important to remember is that we have good news, the best news ever. And so we are not supposed to just keep it to ourselves. We're supposed to go help tell others about it. Why? Because hearing, faith comes from hearing. Hearing by the word of God. That's Hebrews 10, 17. Sometimes we get scared that we're too inadequate. Sometimes we get scared that we don't know enough. Sometimes we get scared that we're going to be rejected. Nobody wants to be rejected. I get that. I've been there. A lot of us in this church have been there. But the important thing is, are you being obedient? We're supposed to go. We're supposed to preach, even though we don't even realize it. So we do that through works. We do that through words. And sometimes, guys, you don't understand this. Regardless of what your personality is, you may be the most extroverted, life of the party. Guess what? If you understand your life mission, God is going to use your personality to affect other people. Now, on the flip side, what if you're an introvert and you're scared to death to talk to anybody? What if you just want to stay in your little circle and not even talk to anyone? Well, I know a lot of people who are introverts who still use things like their social media platform to share things about the gospel. They still, in their very small social circles or at their workplaces, they still have the ability to be used even in their personality. God still uses them, their quiet introvert personality, to still make a difference for his kingdom. It's all about your perspective. Will you let him use you in that way? Because the last part of this works, words, and the last one is wonders. As we do good works and as we share those life-giving words, we can expect God to confirm his message a lot of times through amazing signs and wonders. You know, a lot of people experience something beautiful and amazing when they just give their faith over to their creator. He shows up in an amazing way. Sometimes it's not miraculous. Sometimes it's very small and subtle, and he work, God works through his people in the church family. But sometimes, I mean, it is amazing. It wakes you up, and, oh my gosh, God really is who he said he was. So we need to be able to go and make those disciples. We also need to be able to baptize very quickly. Now, baptism is, is this important, really important, clear-cut example from Jesus, guys. It's, a, it's an important sign of obedience that someone has become a Christian. So throughout the New Testament, it's very clear that it was to be a vital next step after someone has believed and repented of their sins. So through baptism, that person publicly declares that they are now a follower of Jesus, identifying with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. So let us encourage someone that is starting to come to the faith that it's also important for them to know that Jesus gave this beautiful example. Perfect, sinless Jesus gave a beautiful example. Get baptized. And now think about this. The voice of God from heaven didn't come booming down until after Jesus came up out of the water. And after he was baptized by John the Baptist and came up out of the water, what did that voice from heaven say? This is my son in whom I am well pleased. See, that didn't happen before he got baptized. That happened after Jesus got baptized. Perfect, sinless Jesus. It's a great example. And then in turn, Jesus turns around and tells his disciples, if they believe, baptize them. Now see, that's pretty important. If it wasn't important... God wouldn't say it. So it's pretty important. So we need to be able to help them to encourage someone that's coming to faith to express their faith in Christ by being baptized. And let me just talk to you for a second. If you consider yourself a follower of Christ, if you consider yourself a Christian, and you've not been baptized, let me encourage you to do so. 
It is a public declaration that you are a follower of Jesus. It's something amazing, and it's very encouraged spiritually, biblically, through your Heavenly Father. So thirdly, we're also instructed to teach. So remember I told you that every Christian believer is a teacher? That's right. Let's teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. So, guys, as moms everywhere will testify on Mother's Day, giving birth is the beginning of a long journey. Amen? Giving birth is just the beginning. And it's the same way when someone comes to their faith. Maybe they make a decision to follow Jesus. I don't know what I'm doing with my life, but I just know that I need to do something better. And Jesus is the, the thing that I, he is the entity that I know that I need to give my allegiance to. I'm ready to surrender to him. That's just the beginning. Baptism isn't the end of your process. It's the beginning of your process. So I want you to think about this. If the commission to make disciples, going, baptizing, and teaching, if that sounds all too daunting to you, then you need to take heart because we are not left alone. Jesus finishes this great commission by reminding his disciples then and now that if you want to be fulfilled in your life mission, you need to be willing to bring others to Christ. That's something that's so important because the power of our mission is in his presence. It's in the presence of Jesus. In spite of the many platforms, guys, the, the social networking that goes on today, you know there's still so many people that feel terribly lonely? It's hard to imagine. But the, one of the greatest blessings of Christianity and one of the greatest lessons of the 40 days of Jesus hanging out on this earth after he resurrected is that Jesus is alive and he's very real. And Jesus could have been resurrected and just gone back to heaven. But instead, we have encounter after encounter after encounter after encounter with these people. So Jesus could prove the point. He's alive, he's well, and he is with you. And he's telling us that he wants us to do something if we trust him with that. So we are never supposed to feel alone. One of the themes of Matthew's gospel, I love this. One of the themes of Matthew's gospel, the very beginning, chapter 1, we're talking about the, the Christmas story. We're talking about the amazing Jesus, and the way Matthew said it was Emmanuel, God with us. Look at the last verse in this book. Surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. In the beginning, Jesus is with us. In the end, Jesus is still with us. Amen? He's there. He's in your heart. He's all around you. We just have to be mindful of that. Surely I'm with you always, even to the very end of the age. And in making this promise, Jesus was looking forward to his ascension. But think about it like this. Why is this important? How is this promise so well known that Jesus is going to be with us always? The certainty of his promise is in the word surely. Surely. We are never alone. The certainty of his promise is in surely. The extent of his promise is in always. And the duration of his promise is to the end, to the very end. That's how you know this promise is so real and so true that he is with you always. So the staggering truth is we are never alone. Guys, if you want to reach the fullness of your life mission, you need to be empowered and led by the comforting presence of Jesus. If you will allow yourself to be led and empowered by that comforting presence of Jesus, it will make a difference. It will make such a difference that you will think to yourself, oh my gosh, he really has helped change me for the better. So, I tell you the truth, unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. That's Jesus' words back in the book of John. Jesus knew he was going to have to go away at some point. And so in these types of words leading his people, he knows that he's going to send the Holy Spirit to them. And in this way, Jesus' work is going to be multiplied all over this world. And now 2,000 later, 2,000 years later, through you. 
So remember that we are never alone. So as we start to wrap up today, I want you to look at this. Are you held up by the mission? Are you thinking to myself, well, you know, Jeremy's uh, preached and he didn't really speak to me today because I just don't have any desire to go out and evangelize. Well, don't worry. Don't worry. I'm not asking you to just be an evangelist. I'm asking you to listen to the obedience of Christ in these words. Because his disciples, you've got to remember, they were so fearful. They were so worried about so many other things. But after Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to them, they were incredibly empowered. They were incredibly changed. So when you think that you can't do this type of work, you can't do this life mission that Jesus is asking you to do. When you think that it's too daunting and you can't reach it, remember this. Go. Baptize. Teach. I am with you always. And when you're too scared that you're not the right person to do this, think about it very easily from this aspect. Think about how to befriend or how to think about your friends and family. Maybe you should make a list. Make a list of your friends, your family, your social circles, the people that you come in contact with that you've never once talked to them about Jesus. Now remember, it's not just about words. Sometimes it's the things that you do. It's the works that you show. Sometimes that's the gospel message that brings someone to Jesus first, more so than you just feeling like, I have to stand on a box on a street corner and evangelize. It doesn't have to be that, okay? But the point is, are you being obedient in this life mission? Sometimes you might just need to start that process of befriending and then doing even a little bit more to pray. Pray for God's Spirit to work in their hearts. Think about those people that you know that need Jesus and begin to pray for them. And a lot of times what you're going to do is you're going to invest in conversations with them at that point. You're really going to invest in their life. You're really going to take time to get to know them and what's important to them. And then you're going to be able to think about how was Jesus so important to me in these moments of questioning and uncertainty? How was Jesus so important? And then there's going to be a moment, especially if you've prayed for an opportunity, there's going to be a moment for you to share. There's going to be a moment for you to be able to showcase those wonders in your own life. And God's going to work through it. And it's going to be natural. And it won't be as awkward as you think it will be. And there won't be such a rejection that you think is coming. Because a lot of times, I need you to think about it from the perspective of a famous quote. If you've got the cure for cancer, shouldn't you share it? Well, guess what? You have the cure for spiritual death. Now get out there and share it. Anybody ever watched Growing Pains in the 80s and 90s? That was Kirk Cameron. You ever watch any of these new Christian movies that are made like Fireproof? That's Kirk Cameron. In his ministry, he's able to evangelize through movies, through TV shows. He's able to say, listen, I know that it doesn't all come naturally to us, but if you've got the cure for cancer, wouldn't you share it? Well, if we are Christians, we understand we have the cure for spiritual death. Jesus is with us always. Somebody might need to know that. So remember, what would you do in Jesus' name? If you knew that you wouldn't fail, if you knew that it was going to be successful, what would you do in Jesus' name? Don't feel held back by your own inadequacy. Let God work in your inadequacy. That's when he showcases how strong he is. And remember, live in such a way that those who know you but don't know God will come to know God because they know you. Sometimes those little introverted folks, my friends that are too scared to even say two words to people, sometimes the way they live is, is so much of the gospel that someone around them needs. Don't be afraid to showcase those good works and how Christ has changed you because that is going to be the trigger that helps people to see the amazing work of Jesus in you even before you say a word about it. Every Christian believer is a teacher today.
including you. Every Christian believer is a teacher. You're either teaching them that Jesus is important or he's not. So let's be a believer. And I want you to think about this. If you don't go, if you fail to go, they may fail to know. They may fail to know how important he is. They may fail to know what Jesus has done. And if our life's mission is to make disciples, to be patient and kind, just like my mother was with me, just like I am with my daughter, it's one thing if I do something quickly, I can get it done myself, but nobody learns anything that way. We need to be intentional about bringing them along. So today, I want you to go. And I want you to think about how important Jesus is. Ready? Set? Let's go together. Let's pray. Father God, I just come before you today. And I just want to thank you, Lord, on this beautiful Mother's Day that you will continue to help us to know your beautiful blessings for us in this life. And Lord, just like me, for so many years, I didn't know what you wanted me to do. I didn't know what my life's mission was. I worked a lot of jobs, and I was good at those jobs, but Lord, I didn't know what my life's mission was. But Father, when I become obedient to your work, I understand how you want me to be able to do things for your kingdom. And I pray, Lord, that everybody watching this video, video today can feel that pull in their heart to know that you are working in them and want to continue to work in them. Please continue to guide and direct us. Please continue to help us to feel your trust in everything that we do. And help us to remember, Lord, that everywhere we go, you are with us. We love you. We thank you. And I pray that each one of us here today is thinking about those people in our life, friends, family, co-workers, people that we come in contact with. Help us to be obedient to finding ways to be able to share this beautiful good news of Jesus and what he's done in our own lives and how our little church family can continue to make you so incredibly just blessed, Father, because every day we need to be blessing you just as you bless us. Thank you, Lord, for all that you are and all that you do. And I praise you today, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, guys. Have a beautiful day. Thank you so much, and God bless you, mothers. Bye-bye. Oh, shoot. Hey, turn this off. Right side. Uh, I broke it.